we are going to talk about Docker and its uh, usage in uh, development and production. And also we are going to talk about is it hype or not. Uh, and first question to the audience. Uh, please raise the hands who used Docker before. Okay, I think seven people. Okay, so uh, my presentation will be divided in three parts. So first part will be a short introduction to the Docker. What is it? Uh, second part will be uh, showing examples from real life. Uh, how I use Docker in different companies in the last two years. And the third part will be hands-on session. So uh, I will show you uh, how to install Docker on fresh virtual machine um, in the cloud. Uh, and how to write a uh, simple Docker container that will run Nginx inside of it. So let's start. Um, about me, uh, I'm head of development at Inspox. Uh, I have been using uh, Docker for the last one and a half years. Um, I'm working now almost 20 years in the IT industry. And if you want to contact me and ask some questions after presentation, here are my LinkedIn and Twitter accounts. OK, so what is a Docker? Docker is a system that allows you to easily run isolated processes inside Linux. Um, and the question is right away, how is it different from virtual machines that we use for now, I think, like 15 years? And the biggest difference that if you look at the slide, that in both cases we have a physical server, we have host OS, and then in case of uh, virtual machines, we have hypervisor, and then we have each virtual machine that first runs your guest OS, and then only your application. So what's different with Docker? With Docker, you also have your physical server, you have your host OS, but then you have thin layer of Docker engine. And using it, you run your uh, applications, and you have no virtualization. You have no overhead that's created by uh, virtualization technology, uh, because all technologies that Docker use are part of a Linux kernel. So, what is the Docker and how it was born? Um, to, in 2008, there was uh, founded one company that was called Dot Cloud. It was one of the many uh, pass providers, and uh, as many pass providers, they needed to run uh, load from their customers, and they need to isolate. Uh, processes and workloads, so they used Linux containers. And if you used before Linux containers, it's not so uh, developer friendly, so they developed their f uh, internal framework to work with them. And uh, they used it for almost four years. And then they decided to totally rewrite it from the scratch. Um, using their experience as guide, uh, guiding lines. And that became the Docker. And it was finished, so first versions of it uh, that were production ready were, were finished in the beginning of 2013. And at that point of time, they decided, hey, maybe somebody else will be interested to use it. So they decided to open source it almost two years ago. It was 13 March 2013. And the community was very excited about it because many companies already used Linux containers and knew the pain and knew that like everybody had their own scripts or systems to manage it. And if you want to use something from other company, probably those frameworks will be incompatible. So uh, the Docker decided to do not just total rewrite of the, the system. They decided to create framework that will allow any developer to easily use containers. And after three months, 
there was already huge community support. And at that point of time, uh, Dot Cloud uh, decided to shift it, uh, its company focus from being pass provider to the company that will develop Docker exclusively. So pass became the second product of the company. At that point of time, they uh, hired new CEO who was before that CEO in Plex, if maybe you know about such company. And uh, from that point on, the main focus of dot .cloud became the Docker. Um, I think in, in six or seven months, they decided even to rename the company from dot .cloud to Docker Inc. And last year, uh, their past solution uh, was sold to another company, so now Docker Inc. Or only ma managing Docker. Um, so uh, Docker, it was committed as open source, and it's continues to be open source project. Uh, it's not crippleware or freemium model as you uh, see in many products. So all source code of uh, Docker is publicly available. Uh, all functionality is free and uh, open to everyone. Uh, and even more, uh, because it's a very big project, it's not controlled by Docker. Uh, it's controlled by a committee of developers that maintain a Docker code base and decide what goes in and out. And only half of those people are employees of Docker. Other half is composed of people from Red Hat, IBM, Google, and other companies that do contributions. And you could say, well, how viable this company could be. They have open source. They don't monetize it. And how is sustainable? Well, last year, they received $40 million and to work on this project and buy some small companies. Uh, they bought FIC, they bought a uh, couple small ones to incorporate, but mostly it was talent acquisition. So how do they monetize? Uh, we'll see later in the slides that this option to use a uh, registry hub for storing your Docker containers, and uh, Docker provides it. And if you want to have your Docker containers available for public, it's free. But if you want to have private containers, then you need to pay for it as one of the options. So that's, at the moment, their only monetization model. And on top of that, they also provide uh, consultancy services. So that's it. OK, so what's required to run Docker on your Linux? And uh, I want to mention that currently only Linux is supported. Uh, there was some talks in, uh, and with Microsoft to support Windows, but it's not sure how it's going to be done. I think in six months we'll see what will happen. So first of all, your Linux version need to have kernel at least 3.8. Then uh, your server should be running 64-bit uh, operating system, and you should be using uh, Intel AMD processors. So ARM is not officially supported yet. There are community patches that add support for ARM processors, but it's not officially supported yet. I think in maybe three, six months, there will be official support. And you need to have union file system uh, to store Docker containers. Uh, Linux, if you're talking about uh, Ubuntu, it comes pre-installed with a device mapper, but uh, there are other options also like OutFS, OverlayFS, BetterFS, and so on. So how Docker is working, what it's using? Uh, it's actually using four big pieces from uh, Linux. First one, they use namespaces to isolate your processes. So when you run Docker container, it sees only its own process. It doesn't see anything else in host operating systems. Then uh, we use control groups, or shortly C groups, to restrict how much memory and CPU 
each container could be using in Linux. Then we use a network bridge in Linux. So each container will be running its own uh, network bridge and with its own IP. And by default, it doesn't see anything else. And then you need to have a union file system installed here on Linux so you could store uh, Docker containers. And Docker containers is basically layers of read-only files. Now, that's what it's used from Linux. So what is a Docker? Docker is a Linux daemon that's running. And you communicate with it usually using command line interface. It's Docker utility that's named Docker. And you could also enable access to the Docker containers uh, using HTTP or HTTPS from other computers. And you could also subscribe to events that are produced by Docker Diamond. So for example, if you want to integrate uh, Docker containers into your system and you want to know when some containers are starting or stopping or killed, then you could subscribe to events and get that information. And when you have Docker containers, you need to, you need to have a place where to, to store them. And I mentioned here two options. There are third options, third option also, but I don't recommend it, but I will talk about it also. So first option is official registry. It's called registry hub. It's uh, created by Docker. Uh, it's a place where you could upload your uh, Docker containers and you could make them public or private. If they're public, it's free. You don't need to pay anything. Uh, but everybody could download them and use them. If you want to have private containers, basically so only you could download them and uh, update, then you need to pay Docker. Um, I think at the moment pricing something like $12, $12 per month for 10 containers, something like that. But you have another option. You, you could run your private registry inside your corporation or network, uh, and it's free. It's open source. Um, that's, for example, what we use in our company. So. Uh, it's also very easy to run because it's Docker container. You run, run Docker container that is a Docker register. Um, and third option that I mentioned that because Docker container is just the read-only layers that consist of the files, you could export Docker container to the file and store, for example, it's on your network or uh, Amazon S3, but you'll be losing a lot of functionality, but it's also an option, what we could have. So um, that's kind of quick introduction to the Docker. What is it? If you're interested in more details, then uh, in two months there will be uh, official uh, Docker training uh, that will be organized by Dev Training. So you could contact them and sign up. So now we're going to the second part. And here I will talk about real life examples, uh, how we uh, solved certain problems using Docker. Of course, Docker is not silver bullet. It's not only solution that you could use to solve some of those problems that I'm going to talk about. But uh, in my experience, it was the easiest one, especially if you're a small startup. If you're a big corporation like Netflix and you have a lot of resources, there are many different uh, solutions and frameworks and systems that you, you could use, but they will require like heavy, very heavy investment. So first uh, uh, example, um, quick environment setup. Um, one year ago, we started a project in our company to detect uh, misbehaving users in our system, and our company does dating sites. Um, 
we used, we, we wrote a system that used machine learning, it used some um, very heavy components like uh, MongoDB with Kafka, Storm. Uh, in Storm, we uh, used Python. Uh, Python used some machine learning in libraries. And the problem was that even though everything was automated, we had Vagrant and uh, scripts in Vagrant scripts, we have Chef and Bash scripts to bring any, everything up. So a developer could write just Vagrant up and on his laptop, like, totally new environment will be brought up with everything configured. Problem was that uh, some of the Python libraries that we use for machine learning, uh, they compiled packages from source code in C and Fortran, and even on like very quick notebooks, it took almost two hours to compile everything. And that was a problem for us, because sometimes you want to like start from the scratch, delete your local dev environment and bring it up and waiting two hours is too much. So what we did, we shifted these two hours from paying them every time we want to bring up environment to only that moment in time when we make some changes to the packages that we use. So we moved all those steps to the Docker container so when you build Docker container, yes, it will take two hours. But in our case, we modified this like, component that we used only, I don't know, like four or five times during uh, one year. And after that, you have Docker image that uh, consists of all packages already installed, all components installed. And then next time you want to use this uh, development environment, you will be limited only by your network speed. So you, you need to download uh, those Docker containers from your local server. In our case, we have one gigabit connection to our server that's storing them, so usually it takes one minute to download like three gigabytes of binary data and start environment. Um, Another problem that encountered, uh, it's, it was actually the problem that forced me to try and use Docker almost two years ago. Um, I, at that point in time, uh, I was uh, working in one startup, and we had the problem that load in our system was fluctuating like very much. Uh, at one point in time, we could have like 10 servers in Six hours, we need to have 500 servers online to handle uh, load. And we had everything automated. We had Ansible scripts. We had auto-provisioning in Amazon Cloud configured. And everything was working majority of the time. And then, sometimes, you will get the problems at night or weekends when uh, your script will start provisioning the server, but then, uh, it will, your script will try to download something from third party repository and that repository is down. Or for example, uh, you will try to download some file and that repository doesn't have that file anymore. And so how big problems there, there were, um, for example, when we used Azure, two years ago there were moments when official Ubuntu repositories that were mirrored on Azure were done for like one day. So you can install uh, even something like basic stuff that's in official uh, Ubuntu repositories. So what we did, we moved everything into container. So, and uh, uh, we hosted those containers in uh, Docker uh, uh, registry. So our only third party dependency became Docker Registry Hub. And Docker Registry Hub has very high availability, so it usually doesn't go down. So that solved it for us. Of course, there are other solutions for this problem. For example, in Netflix, what they did, they pre-baked a virtual image with all software. But the problem was that we were a very small startup. For us, it was much easier to write small Docker file than to deal with this whole 
pre-baking MEI stuff. And especially if you want to support multiple clouds, it will be a problem. Because if you want to create a uh, virtual image that will run on Amazon, Azure, or Google Cloud, it will be totally different, three different processes. Mm. That's uh, the thing that um, usually you have uh, sometimes problems in development that your developer compiles the code, updates the systems, and he says, it runs on my laptop, everything's okay, but then it goes to, for example, staging environment or production, and it doesn't install there. And then you need to troubleshoot what is happening. In one product, uh, we had uh, the problems with Node.js, NP NPM repository. It has very strange things with dependencies that you cannot like fully log them. So uh, we're, we're like getting those kind of problems all the time. So um, what we did, we, we again forced everybody to use go to go containers. So when developer tests something on his laptop, he will build the container with updated code and uh, modified versions of the components. And then the same container will be used on all environments. This small asterisk, and it's there because uh, even though you could use the same code on all environments, usually different environments have different configurations. And uh, you, you need to deal, to deal with that. And uh, you will need to think about, so it's not easy just like build container and push it everywhere. You need to think how to uh, push environment specific configuration to your container. The same as you do with the application, same will be uh, actually and with a uh, container. This is a um, very really tricky point if you are uh, using cloud. Um, because on your development uh, laptop or server, you could be running Ubuntu, for example, or Debian. But when you will be uh, running your service in Amazon, your best option is to use a uh, Linux version uh, that is maintained by Amazon because it's tuned for Amazon. That's the best practice. Um, and you get the best value. The same uh, Google, for Google Cloud, they also like, they have modified version of Debian. They didn't support it, Ubuntu. So if you're like Ubuntu guy, then you needed to support Debian if you were running Google Cloud. With Azure, uh, you could run Ubuntu, but you need to install specific software in it to, to run. And that meant that instead of having one script, deployment script and installation script, you needed to have script that managed all different versions of Linux. So you could run your software in development and in production. And how Docker uh, help here? So um, now all your code runs inside container, and that container has one specific version of Linux that you choose. And then in Debian or Ubuntu or uh, Amazon Linux, all you need to do is to install Docker. That's it. After that, you reuse your Docker container that's running version of Linux that you know and familiar with. Oops. Um, that's, that problem uh, was like, this problem is actual for I think almost all companies that uh, usually you have smaller amount of development and QA environments than you have developer developers and QA engineers in your company. In the past, if you have had a team like 20 developers and everybody wanted to use their own environment, um, nobody is going to buy the, like such amount of hardware. Um, 
So what changed with Docker? Uh, because Docker containers almost have no overhead, and because it's very easy to replicate them and duplicate because they are like self-contained. Uh, what we did, we uh, put all components of our uh, development environment into Docker containers. So right now, I think it consists of something like 11 different containers. And then you could run multiple copies of them on one server. And it will use almost no resources. Of course, it depends on your applications. If you have some Java applications that requires minimum of two gigabytes to start, then uh, of course you will be limited by memory. But in majority of the cases, uh, if they are not many, uh, like not very big load on the system, especially that's true in developing in QA, or there is not much load by all environments at the same time, you could run multiple environments on very small hardware. Uh, for example, we have one server that has something like 64 gigabytes of memory, six cores, and right now we are running seven environments. Each consists of 11 components on it, and it's using only half of the capacity of the server. If we need new environment for a key engineer, we could spin up in, like, in one minute. And now everybody has their own environment, and if they need like additional environment for their needs, just like developer goes, changes one small script, and like in one minute he goes, he gets uh, his dedicated environment. And last case, it will be three different cases that connected to one, but uh, two years ago we were working in startup and using different components to not like reinvent the wheel. And what happened that we had conflicting components. That we used third-party systems that used different versions of the shared libraries and they were conflicting with each other. And we needed to install those uh, components on different physical servers. When we moved everything to the Docker, because now the, those conflicting uh, like libraries only live uh, inside each container, you don't have any conflicts. And this simplifies your upgrade and especially rollback procedures. Because with Docker containers, everything is uh, like inside one container. If you want to upgrade, you just run new version of container. If you want to roll back, you just run the previous version. If you're working with uh, physical server, and you have your deployment script, you do deployment of new version that modifies some libraries, and everything is okay, but if your release fails and you need to roll back, that is usually big pain, because you need to, before each upgrade, you need to take a backup, and then to do a rollback, usually you need to restore a specific set of folders and configuration and so on. And the third part, um, we're using, again, third-party software, and um, some components, they usually have administrative UI, and that administrative UI in many cases doesn't have a lot of configuration, and for some reason everybody wants to listen on port 80. So what happens that you have multiple systems running on one server, and you can run the administrative UI on those servers because like, they are conflicting, everybody is like, wants to listen on the same port. When we move to the Docker, it's no longer a problem. Because inside the Docker contain, container, each application could use any port it's like, but then you could uh, map uh, with Docker and say what port from inside maps to what port inside host OS. So I could easily map one container to port 8080, another one to 8081, and so on, and there will be no conflicts. Okay. So, that was all 
pluses and pink stories, how everything is great. But there are also some cases when you will be enabled to use Docker or maybe it will give you no benefits. So when? First, I think the biggest problem that I see usually is that you don't have control of environments where you need to run your applications. Either uh, release and deployment is done by separate team or it's done and controlled by operations team. And unless you convince them that you want to use, for example, Docker and what kind of benefits it will give, uh, it doesn't matter until those teams decide that like, they want to move forward. And in my experience, usually operations teams is the most conservative one. It's very good. They should be very conservative ones, but sometimes they're too conservative. It could take them like years of technology to be uh, like used in production by other companies before even they consider to use it. And then they will say, hey, we, we are busy all the time. We don't have any, any time to move to anything new. And I don't know, maybe it will not benefit us and so on. So if you are in this kind of situation and you want to use Docker, your first step will be to get good relationship with the teams that control them and make sure and show them how it will make uh, their life easier if you use Docker. Um, in some cases, Docker could be overkill. Uh, it looks like it's not a lot. You just need to install Docker on the Linux. You need to install some uh, union file system on it, at least drivers. But if your application consists of one jar or one static executable, like you know, like you have your program is written in Go and it compiles to one executable, then your current process could be you just connect to the server, upload one file, and that's it. If you're going to use Docker, not only you need now to install Docker on the server, but you also need to build Docker container every time you build new version, then you need to upload to the server and so on. It will be overkill for you. So if you have something very simple, maybe it doesn't make sense to use Docker. And the third case is that if you're a big company, and you already have everything automated. You have your Chef, Puppet, or Ansible, whatever scripts. Uh, you already mirror all your third-party dependencies in your uh, network server, so uh, your deployments will not break if, for example, like Python repository or whatever repository goes down. And you already pre-bake like virtual images with all your software, so installing uh, in production is very quick, then moving to the Docker will take some time. And you will get the benefits, but it will be a lot of overhead, and it, will, it, it could take a long time. If you have very simple systems, um, you could rewrite everything to the Docker in like in days. Because basically, Docker file syntax is, is like bash. If you know bash, you could easily write Docker files. But if you have your complex deployment scripts, for example, in Chef, and especially if you use something like community scripts that are universal to install on every flavor of the Linux, then converting those scripts to the like bash-like commands will take some time because in most cases you don't even know what is written inside those scripts. So now uh, it will be uh, demo time. Um, let me connect to the server. And
Oops. Look. Okay. Okay, do I need to make a font bigger? Is that okay? A little bit. Okay, let me try. That's good, thanks. Better? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what we have? We have clean Ubuntu 14.10. Uh, yep. Or clean. Okay, and we don't have Docker installed. So. Um, there are two ways to install Docker. Uh, the quick and dirty way, that's it's not recommended in production. And there's proper way. So we're going to use uh, quick way because it's, it's a demo. If you want to see like uh, proper way, then just go to the Docker site and it has excellent documentation how to install uh, Docker on every flavor of the Linux that you could be using. So, can you increase the font size? Yeah, sure. Let me turn on. Okay, let me see if full screen. Better? Or more? Okay. Okay, so what we're doing, um, this uh, bash script that's hosted by uh, Docker, so if you download it and run it, it will auto detect what version of uh, Ubuntu you're using and it will install Docker and on top of that it will also automatically install OurFS. OurFS is a uh, union layer of file system driver. It's recommended uh, one. So now it will take a little time. Hmm, I think. I think we have problem with the screen because it's not showing anything. Okay. Okay, so now we have Docker installed, version 150. And to run Docker, you need to use sudo. And because I'm lazy, again, it's not recommended for production. Okay. Now we could use without sudo. Okay. So we now have Docker installed, version 1.5.0. We could write Docker info, and it will say to us that. Uh, we currently have no containers, no images download, and storage driver is OurFS. That's very important. Um, if it says device mapper, by default, uh, don't use the device mapper. You will have problems in production in one point uh, in time, so use OurFS. And it says what version of kernel we have, so we're okay. And how much memory we have. So, now we're going to run a Docker container. Okay, so what I have written. Uh, I said Docker, run, 
minus i minus t means that I want to have interactive shell and I want to use uh, official Ubuntu container and we stack 14.10 and after we download it and run I want to use to start bin bash in it. So it says okay I'm unable to find this image locally so now it's downloading it 200 megabytes so just in case I'm not running this locally on my, my notebook it's virtual machine in, in Azure because downloading 200 megabytes over this Wi-Fi I think it will take a very long time Take it. So uh, it's uh, Docker is able to download uh, all different layers in parallel, and after it downloads, it checks, and now we should be. Ready. Okay, so we are inside new Docker container and we could check what this it's Ubuntu 14 and if we look there's nothing running except our uh, bash process. So by default nothing is running inside a Docker container unless you say to good Docker to run it. So no default Linux processes will be running there. And if you see, I asked Docker to run bin bash inside this container and it has PID1. Usually PID1 is occupied by a system process. And we could see that we have all the files and now we are going to do something that's very not recommended to do in production. Uh, preserve. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, okay. So now we have very corrupted Linux system because we just deleted all files in it that we could but if we exit from it and ask to run Ubuntu again everything is back why? Uh, because by default uh, each container consists of read only layers, layers of the files and when you write run your docker container it creates one new layer and all your changes will be captured in that layer but after you exit the container that layer is discarded so now let's try to make something useful and I think that we are going to create Google container, oh sorry, uh, Docker container and run uh, Nginx inside of it. So, okay. and we are going to write Docker file. So I said Docker file is uh, the file that describes commands to build uh, Docker container and it it looks like bash but it has its own specific commands so first of all we need to say it say that our container will be basing on uh, Ubuntu 14.10 so when you're starting container you need to base it from something if, if you want to run uh, something on top of Ubuntu you need to start it from Ubuntu container uh, you could also start from scratch like there will be no files inside container for that this special container named scratch but then uh, uh, 
the problem is you will have no Linux inside of it. So you, uh, you will have nothing. If you want to run something inside that empty container, you need to upload all binaries that you need to <laughs> for your work. Okay, so we started from Ubuntu. And then we say that first command we are going to update everything and then we are going to install Nginx so those two commands run after get update on a run up to get install nginx minus yet it will install latest version of nginx from official ubuntu repository and that flag at the end is important because uh, uh, when we'll be compiling docker container uh, by default apt get will ask you do you want to install it yes no and that point of time your build will fail so you need to make all commands uh, silent and def uh, take default prompt. And because we are going to be running Nginx, we want to have port 80. So, oh, this, this character here, it says expose. So we are exposing port 80. Uh, so uh, we could connect to Nginx from outside container. And then we are writing that uh, inside container, when it starts, we want to run Nginx and diamond. We start Nginx, it just say that it should uh, not run in, run in daemon mode uh, because by default uh, when you run docker container it starts process that you specify and when that process ends uh, docker container will exit. Uh, if you leave daemon on then after the start Nginx will fork and your process will exit. Okay. We have docker file, uh, now let's try to build it. And to build it, this common docker build. And then, uh, let's say we'll, so. Now we have a docker file that specifies how to construct our docker container. And now we say docker build and dot means take docker file from current directory and then minus t is tag tag this do, uh, docker container with name dev club minus nginx and place it under my username that's uh, i have in docker repository it's crude so when you run it uh, it's uh, runs app to get right now update Okay, let's hope that everything works. Now we are installing Nginx. taking some time. I think it should be finished about right now. Okay. So, docker images. Images command will uh, say to docker, list all docker containers that are present in, in our system. So we have Ubuntu containers of different versions, antenna, topic, and so on. And uh, also our new container that we created four seconds ago. So now let's run it. Okay. 
So we have run this container. If we write docker ps, oh. hmm, it's not running. The command nginx, like step four command nginx, unknown instruction. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. OK. Our build failed, sorry, guys. CMD X um. Ah, okay. Okay, now it's okay. So, um, as you see, uh, when I corrected the Docker file and run build process, it doesn't execute all the steps again. It's only executed those steps that were like failing. So we failed at this step. So all those steps were already cached. So we only needed to compile those ste steps. Okay. Now let's. What? Images. Yeah. So we have. Sorry? Yes. Because it's now a, so ID changed because we created new Docker container and I've written it. Same name? Yeah, same name. And by default, if you don't specify the tag, it will be the tag latest. Okay, built. Okay, so okay, so now we have uh, nginx running in uh, Docker container. So now we need to connect to it. And to do that, uh, we need to find a network uh, IP address of this container. So network. Okay. So, what I did, uh, I used Docker command inspect. What it says that um, again. Um, so, when we uh, run Docker image, uh, it's automatically assigned unique ID, this long string, this, uh, the image name that we used, the command that was used to run, how long ago it was created, when it's run, and also uh, this automatically generated name. So if you don't specify a name for your container, container it will be automatically generated for you, so it will be two words with underscore, created from some uh, dictionary. Sometimes you get very funny names. Um, so what I wrote, I said inspect this running container and uh, give me uh, its IP address. So now that I have this IP address, I could curl it and here we go. We see that Nginx is running. So that's default HTML, index HTML that's returned by um, Nginx. But um, let's say we want to modify something inside container. How we could do that? That uh, by default, Docker uh, fi files in, in Docker container are read only. That includes those files that we installed in it for Nginx. And uh, to do that, uh, we uh, could use uh, Docker command volumes. With volume command, command you basically say that um, you have specific path in your uh, file system inside uh, Docker container. And I want to replace everything that situated on this path 
with, for example, a folder that is in host operating system. So um, let me just um, show you. So for example, we will create We will replace uh, default index HTML that's uh, currently baked in inside a uh, Docker container. So, to do that, okay. So, we we execute the same command as before, but now we say that. Uh, we want to want to Linux HTML. That we want to run the same container, but say that we want to. Or we write everything that's inside this folder, inside container, with the content of this folder in our server. So if, if you know Linux, in Linux there's uh, this inode. So basically what you're saying that you're replacing content uh, that's pointed by inode inside the Docker container by inode inside your file system. So. Okay, so now we have two containers running. We could kill the old one. So we don't need it anymore. <coughs> Using docker stop, com stop command. There's docker stop and docker kill. Difference is only uh, the signal that will be sent to your process to stop. Okay. Oop. Okay. So, we have it running. Now let's find IP of our new container. We now have welcome dev club showed instead of um, default nginx in index HTML. But this one thing. Right now, this container, our port 80, is only available uh, in, from this host. So from outside, you couldn't con uh, connect to Nginx. Why? Because by default, no ports from container are exposed outside. So if you enter right now to let me open the browser. Oops. Okay. One second. Okay. So, if you try, so 
this server where we are running our experiment with Docker is available using this uh, name, so it's dce02 cloudup.net, and right now nothing is listening on port 80, but uh, let me show again, I need to restore. Let me increase font size so you can see. Even though I was, our server is running, it's not available from outside. So again, why? Because our ports are not exposed by default. So what we need to do to make Nginx, Nginx available from outside? We need to um, uh, set up port forwarding, and that's just another uh, command line switch. So. Let's stop. stop. Okay. And now let's run our container. And now we are able to access it from outside. So what I did, we set an additional that do port mapping and map port from Google container or Docker container listen on port 80 to port 80 on host OS. So and And that's it. <laughs> OK. So um, if you have any further questions about this presentation or what I was showing, then just feel free to contact me. Uh, if you want to know more about Docker, um, how to install, how to work it, with it, how to write Docker files, how to do orchestration of Docker containers on one server or multiple ones and other topics, then um, feel free to talk with Dev Training. And in May, there will be hands-on training for one day where we spend few couple of hours to uh, understand how Docker works in detail. But then we spend majority of the time during hands-on session when we will be learning the stuff and writing different Docker containers. Thank you.